So I took him up to the hospital, uh, passed him over to Rick Jolly uh, and his team, his trauma team, and they took him into the dressing station and began to treat him. I would love to say thank you because he saved my life or he helped all the surgeons who worked on all of us. And last night, we came up as a company to take this position here. And we were very reluctant to use morphine. And as we came up about 200 metres, we came under fire from up here and also further down as well. But with the SMG, you can physically feel the, the mechanism yes. coming back. Mi respeto y mi agradecimiento hacia los médicos que salvaron mi vida. Paul, how are you, dear brother? I'm very well, thank you. Are you? Yes, mate. I'm utterly delighted um, that you've joined us on the podcast, Paul. Friends at home, Paul and I have known each other a number of years now. We uh, we do like to go out. We've been out in the town a bit in Plymouth uh, a few times with, uh, I don't know, gosh, up to 300 other, other commandos, um, which we do once a year. Friends at home, Paul, absolutely lovely man. Um, if you go online and check out anything about Paul, it's it's just beyond belief. I couldn't do Paul justice with, uh, not with my memory, but what I can tell you is Paul um, joined the Royal Navy as a as a, a rating and left as a lieutenant commander. Uh, he served in Northern Ireland, Falklands War, Gulf War One, Gulf War Two, Cambodia, Kosovo, and Afghanistan. Obviously, um, this year is quite poignant because it's the 40th anniversary of the Falklands. And Paul was a medic down there attached to 4-5 Commando. Paul was uh, good friends with the late uh, Rick Jolly. What what rank was Rick, Paul? He was a surgeon captain when he left. Yes. Um, a, again, another incredible gentleman who was the, I think, one of the only or the only person to be decorated by both sides during the, the conflict um, for their insistence on treating the Argentine casualties um, exactly the same as, the, as as they did the British casualties, which I, I believe is G Geneva Convention. But um, I've read a lot of books on the Falklands and uh, I think uh, a lot of these young Argentines were quite surprised that upon capture, they weren't, can I say, taken out and that they were actually treated with um, all, all, all the respect a, a soldier should extend to to another soldier. So, um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very proud of that. And, of course, um, Rick died, was it about three or four years ago now? It Paul, is, yes, it? Dudley, yeah. Yeah, and there's some um, so much history with, uh, with respect to the Falklands, but... Paul, so I don't talk anymore. Let's let's just go back to your story. What, what, what was your sort of upbringing, and what was it le that led you to um, to join in the mob? Um, well, my dad was a sergeant in the Royal Army Medical Corps, and um, when he left, he, he remained in the uh, what they call the TA, the Territorial Army, or the Terriers, as they call them. When he used to go away at weekends, I used to go away with him. And um, he did a lot of um, casualty simulation during exercises. And I, I got really interested in this. He used, to, he used to make wounds out of plasticine and stuff like that. But um, when I sort of I sort of started my military career at about age 11, um, I came from a, the inner city of Manchester. I was born in a place called Cheetah Mill. Um, and then when I was 11, I passed my 11 plus exam. And I honestly think that that's where my military career started. Um, I came from a rough area of Manchester, but I went to school, went to a grammar school because I passed my 11 plus, which meant I had to walk through the streets of what was similar to Beirut, I suppose, uh, on a daily basis in order to get to this grammar school wearing a uniform, blazer and a cap. And uh, it was hard work, I must admit. <laughs> um, and I did struggle daily to get on two buses to get to this special grammar school. I'd, I was possibly, I'm an educator now. Um, I'm an education officer in the Navy, but I do feel then 
that the 11 plus for me wasn't a good move, I must admit. I, I was taken out of my comfort zone. I was put in an area where I didn't want to be. And all I, I didn't concentrate on academics. I concentrated on sport and survival, really. Um, I was a good rugby player at age 16. Didn't get any qualifications, which, well, I did. I think I got art, English and pottery with the three GCSEs I got. <laughs> so I obviously wasn't going to set the world on fire. But um, I decided then that I would join the Navy. So I went down the careers office. Uh, I went to be a firefighter and uh, they were recruiting firefighters at the time. So I, uh, like loads of others, I ended up joining the Seaman branch. My parents were really pleased. Uh, they, they were quite a bit apprehensive. Uh, interesting that I never gave the, uh, the army a look. Uh, all the Royal Marines, in fact, because actually it wasn't like that in 1975. It was, you went into the careers office, into the Royal Navy, spoke to a sailor, joined the Navy. Hmm. Didn't join as a firefighter, joined as a seaman. Got to rally. Was playing rugby for the first 15 at 16 uh, as a trainee. So I got time off from training to go and play rugby. <clears throat> Finished my part one as a class leader, which was a, a, a great achievement, really, I think. Probably because I was a large, gobby Mancunian, I suppose. Um, started my seaman training. Got a windy hammer out. Uh, and thought, do you know what? I ain't doing this. I've got all levels. So I then spoke to my DO and said, you know, my dad was in the Army Medical Corps. I think I might like to give it a try. So I then transferred to the medical branch as a, a recategorised um, medical assistant. That was all good. Mm. Paul, did to you... Hasler. <clears throat> I should point out that I've been through rally. Lot, not a lot of people would probably think that of a Royal Marine, but yes, so I went through rally and I did my seamanship training. In fact, we went all around the, the, the Southwest Pompey, et cetera, et cetera. Um, did you ever do, I mean, I'm guessing you must've done the damage repair unit. Oh yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us? I do it. I do it now. I don't do it. I, well, I organize for students to go and do it. So I've been in there quite recently and it's still as grim and cold and wet and miserable as it always was. Yeah. I took a lot of, former young offenders there one one time they're very generous in you know who they offer this experience yeah. to and uh all these youngsters that when they're in prison wanted to be the hardest guy on on, on the wing as soon as there's a jet of water pouring out of a gash in a ship <laughs> yeah, <laughs> into yeah. the, into their face at uh, 30 mile an hour um i think the what's the expression sorts the men men from the boys or the, the women from the girls. Certainly it does. Yes, so you become a medic. Yeah. And and uh, I brought this, I suppose I, I did have a bit of an attitude, so I brought this attitude with me to the, the medical branch. And um, my first, at the 18-week point, the big classes, you know, there's 30 odd in the class, and at the 18 week point, we had to do exams. And I think there's something like nine or 10 subjects we had to do exams in. And I was uh, unsuccessful in one of my exams, which was, I think it was medical storekeeping. And um, I got backclassed. And in those days, what happened was one, one uh, class went to Hasler to do their part three training, and the other class went to, to uh, Plymouth to the Naval Hospital at Stonehouse. So I um, I was due to stay at Portsmouth, but I failed my exam. So they sent me down to Plymouth. I uh, joined a new class in Plymouth. But that was absolutely fantastic. You know, the guys in Portsmouth did submarines, surface flotilla, uh, and tended to stay in that part of the world. I came to Plymouth where we had the Royal Marines and surface ships. Well, I didn't really fancy surface ship. Rally wasn't too much of a challenge, uh, to be honest. A couple of assault courses and a bit of running. But, you know, I was a pretty good standard rugby player, so I did fancy a bit of a challenge. And I was put in exactly the right place to be. And I, I must admit, my uh, I didn't, I've never failed another exam since. Oh, actually, I failed my driving test the first time. But, um, yeah, no, I haven't failed another exam since. But life was just laid on a plate for me, really. It's perfect. So qualified, went on my all arms. Uh, as soon as I qualified as an MA, 
I uh, took a volunteer post uh, and went to Stonehouse Ballots to start my beat up um, on the All Arms Commando course. And that was about November 77. So I must have qualified about August 77. No, I'm lying. Sorry. I must have qualified about as a medic about July 78. And I was on my All Arms in November. About 35 of us joined. Uh, and, and that was a that was a good laugh. The Royal Marines don't have their own medical assistance because they were they're too busy concentrating on being the the GD and specialist Royal Marine and professionals that they are. And there was some reluctance to take Marines out of their core duties for over a year to train as a medic. So they found it easier to take trained medics and put them through the all arms commando course and that worked it, it doesn't work the same now but it certainly worked in those days but numbers was always an issue about 30 odd of us joined from different establishments big ones little ones fat ones thin ones um no idea how to wear boots and put it on the, <laughs> on the opening three mile uh, bft uh, um some guys didn't have laces or they didn't have putties on and they tried to put keep the boots on with putties, you know, and there was like putties and boots all over the road. And I think after the first run, we'd lost about a dozen people. A couple ended up in prison <laughs> at the main gate because they didn't, didn't want to do this soldiering rubbish. Um, but we stayed on. Six of us finished. Um, the course was stopped. It was a bad winter. It, we had the summer of 76, which was really hot, and we had the winter of... 77 78 which was really really cold mm. i mean i spent most of my uh, commando course over the christmas period digging sheep out on dartmoor because that's you know the the m the big trucks that we use the mks that they all had skis on them you know and there was people skiing on dartmoor that winter and we were trying to do the all arms but um it got better and uh, in the march we fin- six of us finished in the march how is it, Paul, then, doing the All Arms Commando course um, when you're already full-time in the military? Because it's the same course, is it not, that the territorials do, that the reservists do, and but they've got to do it, like, in their spare time? No. It, the, the All Arms Commando course is very different. Um, the aim is for us to complete the eight-week commando course at Limston, which is the final phase that you would have done. Mm. So you, you do 30 weeks training. And so 22 weeks is the build up. And then on the final eight weeks, you do your commando pass out tests. Yeah. Well, we do something very similar, but because we're trained ranks and we take um, the, the, the Navy, the Army, and we take the gunners and the engineers from 2-9 and from 5-9. 2-9 and 5-9 did their own beat-up, but for the Navy, the Royal Marines did the beat-up. We did it at Stonehouse, the engineers did it at Crown of Fort, and the gunners did it at the Citadel. And it was a single-service choice how, how big the beat-up was. Um, and I think we did... I think we did three weeks or two weeks. No, no, it was longer than that. It must have been three weeks or so. Uh, but for us, for the for the medics, we were basically we, we needed to learn military skills because although we all know the saying, a matlow with a gun, um, and and that basically that's how we joined. It was a matlow that had held and fired a gun, uh, but we needed to need, know those intricate skills of uh, weapon handling. So we had a lot to learn. Um, unlike the gunners and the, and the sappers, who, who that was their career, mm. so they concentrated on fitness. We concentrated on everything. So by the time we got to Limpston, we were able to embark on that eight-week commando course and and the pass out. So it was quite difficult for Matlows, and that's why the pass rate was so low, I think, was we didn't have the field skills. We didn't have the weapon skills. Marching and clothing and uniform didn't matter, uh, but we we did need those core skills. Now, I got pally with a a signaller. It wasn't just gunners and engineers. You know, we had signallers as well and Remy. Uh, RAF even we had doctors and padres you know it was a bit of a a bit of a conflagration there on the all arms but I was clever so I got myself 
a corporal signaller to bivy with called Ginge Beverly. And he was a corporal and he was in the army and he knew everything about everything. Or so I thought. So I used to do all the basic skills of living in the field, the cooking, the cleaning and sort of husbandry. And Ginge would clean the weapons and make sure everything was fine. Or should I say, clean his own weapon. Because I spent the rest of my life doing press-ups for having a manky weapon, as you can imagine. So uh, didn't do me any favours having Ginge Beverly as a, as a buddy, but I must admit he was a great bloke. Give us loads of laughs. Can I spin you my dit about M- MA, is it, medical assistant? That's correct, yeah. Yeah. W- w- Paul, when we went to Norway uh, uh, with 4-2, um, we had this MA attached to the unit, right? So I don't know which way round to tell to spin this dip, but ba- 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 basically there was one time we were skiing along in Norway and it was a big ski. It was something like uh, 12 miles or something. And, and uh, you know, the old company snake and everyone's exhausted and it's every 10 minutes you sit down and wait and, and, and it's five minutes smoke break turns into a four hour smoke break. And, and um, the, we had this medic attached to us, but people started to notice there was something like, like not quite right with him. You know what, what we call a bit of a biff, you know, bit, <laughs> a bit sort of useless. Right. And so the message went up the snake and it was man down, get the medic up here now. Right. Then the message comes back down the snake. Oh, it is the medic. It's the medic. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. No, it gets worse. It gets worse. Right. <laughs> Turns out this chap had rocked up to four two to be attached to four two just just as an MA, not command or anything. And he thought, "Oh, I'm with the Marines now. I'd better go to the store and get myself one of those green green berries." <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kid you not, Paul. I kid you not, right? So he just uh, yeah, he just didn't know. So he went to the store and he got himself a green lid and you know he put his naval insignia on it. Went out to Norway because everyone just thought, well, the guy's commander trained. Friends at home, the reason Paul's done this all arms commander course is if you're attached to free commander braid, you you've got to keep up with a brigade. So if you've got a you know bunch of Marines that are really good at yomping, carrying lots of weight, you gotta be able to keep up with them. Yeah. That's 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 why Paul did the commander course. This chap done none of that. <laughs> no. I mean, absolutely. But it happens, it still happens today, you, you know. It's um, when, when I was brigade uh, branch advisor for the for the medical branch. It's very difficult. People don't understand. People serving don't understand, and they say, "Well, why do you have to be commando trained?" Well, I used to explain to people you know, the reason we're commando trained is that the commanding officer has got enough on his plate already, and he has to know that his every man in his unit is capable of doing a river crossing, doing a yomp marching at speed, climbing a cliff, abseiling off a cliff. You know, we've got to be able to do these skills, uh, particularly the river crossings and stuff at night in the cold. It's not easy. So as long as we've qualified to have done, and have run 30 mile carrying weight and have done a nine mile speed match, you know, these things are key so that the colonel knows that when he's got that obstacle, he every man can get over it. What he doesn't want is a Matlow that has just joined for a couple of weeks, who now is lagging behind it. And, and of course, he's the guy that's got to keep everybody going. So uh, mm. it is absolutely imperative that guys in commando units, medics in commando units, are commando trained. Yeah. Uh, and, and I've done, I, I've, I've, I've done in excess of twenty winters. You know, and it is a skill. Living in the cold and living in the field is an absolute skill. Uh, and also, I knew where to be i.e. at the back. So if there was an, an injury forward, I could at least move forward rather, and conserve energy rather than be at the front and have to move back to treat somebody. Mm. So th- there's a lot of skills in there, not least cooking a 24-hour rat pack in the middle of Norway at minus 30. So, yeah, it's important. Yeah, the SAS found out this to their cost. They, they've got a rule in the SAS, unless you're a trooper, you can't go on patrol with them. Yeah. 
but there was a situation down there that uh, I, I believe his name is Sir Cedric Dells. He tells in his uh, book Across an Angry Sea where they just didn't have um, a certain person for the patrol. I, don't know, I think it might have been ra radio operators. So they just, this guy sort of stepped forward and volunteered and they put their heads together and went, oh, okay, yeah, like, he's a big lad. You know, he looks like he can, you know, he talks the talk. And of course... <laughs> <laughs> you know how this you know it ended up with with sir cedric like literally having to drag this man from the enemy across across the falklands and uh it it it, it turned into a turned into a bit of a nightmare yeah absolutely so paul tell tell us more where, where did you move on to then well, what happened then i um i stayed in plymouth I, Having completed my all arms, I then stayed in, I'm 21 now, I think. Yeah, finished my all arms, and I think I was 21 about two days later, something like that. Um, went to Log Regiment, and then, would you believe, uh, I fell off a wall, and we'd had a few beers, and I took a shortcut, fell off a wall, three, four position and everything, but damaged my ankle, well, broke my ankle, in fact. And uh, I was due to join 4-5 in the August, and... Um, so I went up to four or five, joined them in the August with a plaster Paris on. And I tell you what, within two days, I think I was doing helicopter drills with a pot on. And I said, I can't do this. I've got this pot on. And they're like, no, no, you're a liability if you don't do these helicopter drills. So, and you know, that was how, that's how life was. You just got on with it. Mm. Yeah. And I did. So I still had a broken leg in the December when I got married. And I got my mate, who was also a medic, to chop my plaster off. So we cut my plaster off so I could walk down the aisle. Yeah. And then shortly after that, a week later, I'm in Norway skiing. Um, but yeah, fabulous. So cool. straight into four or five. How did you find Norway, honestly? Hated it. I never learned the Norwegian language uh, because I thought I'm not going to make a habit of coming here. Um, but I must admit, uh, my first winter was 79. And then I, I must have done every winter then for about 12 winters. And then kept going back with different units. Uh, I did two great winters with 5-9. Because th what I think, the thing about, I alluded to earlier, if you can cook a rat pack and you can use snow uh, and you can look after your gear, i.e. if you're not using it, it goes back in your pocket or back in your Bergen, um, you can get a good night's kip. You can do amazing things in Norway and there's no midges. And it got to a point that I absolutely loved it. Uh, because I was, I'm a routine, process-driven person. So it was easy for me. I knew what to do when I got in my tent. Uh, mm -hmm. and I knew I needed to, to get in my bag, get my cooker on, get my snow melted, get my scran, get my wet, get my scran cooked, eat my scran, go for a pee, get in my bag, get my head down. It was as did simple you, as that. Did you have to change lingo when you were working with the army? Uh, as in what? Oh, scran and stuff like that. Yeah, you just say wet and scran, and they say, well, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. scoff and a brew. No, I didn't have to change, mate. I changed them. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't just me, but I, I am friendly with a lot of guys from 5.9 and 2.9. I'm in the uh, I'm the treasurer for the Commando Association, so and the predominantly army, because they're, the, they're the biggest. But they secretly take some pride in using our lingo, believe me. And it's all scran, wets, yomps. Yes, I bet. I bet. And great, guy, great guys too. I did my para course with a couple of uh, uh, two nine guys. They were they were freaking hilarious. Absolute, yeah, yeah. absolutely hilarious. Yes. They do, they do want to be part of brigade, don't they? They want to be a, a part of us rather. They're, they're the elite of the, the army. Mm -hmm. it, 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 take the SAS guys and terrified out of it. But, you know, the, these guys won't get any higher than... Mm -hmm. There's a lot to do uh, para reg and then commando or commando para, you know. So there's a lot of um, uh, uh, para commandos around. Mm. And um, I think Rusty Furman was, I think he was two nine, right? And and he did the all arms command, of course, and then obviously famously joined the SAS. I might I might have that wrong, folks, but yeah. I, I spoke to a lot of <laughs> a lot of guests. Um, it, it is a route to Hereford um, through the paras so uh, so for example um, th they might go nine para Royal Engineers then five nine which is now two four regiment 
uh, and then two two SAS, and, and that is a that is the normal route. It, I think it's unusual to go straight to Hereford having not done one of those two two things. Mm-hmm. I tried yeah, to go just... to Hereford, but they said um, it's too handsome. Yeah, yeah, that was the same. I, I got on the wrong bus. I'd, I'd, so, uh, they said I'd never be able to blend in undercover, so uh, forget it, mate. Oh. Yeah. These are the breaks. <laughs> these are the breaks, Paul, aren't they? You know. Yeah, absolutely. So, when what was your first knowledge of the Falklands? Okay, well, if I can, if you don't mind, I'll go back a, a little bit further. Oh, please we, do. We, um, so we did Norway, did a, a summer exercise then we did a mountain phase mountain training and every year we used to do norway mountain training and um so winter norway summer scandinavia or somewhere autumn winter in the highlands of scotland cairngorms ben um sky um that was getting that was doing black shot training, so that's the mountain training. And then in the winter, we go to Norway do Arctic training. So we were mountain and Arctic warfare troops. So we spent all our time mountains, five busting, climbing heavyweights, living in the rain and the cold, and then living in the cold and the dry. Um, but then in um, eighty one, we went to Ireland because we still had to do our island tour. So we went to West Belfast. And um, we had the tour from June to December. Great was that, tour. Was that, did you say 89? 81. 81, sorry. Yeah. Um, Hunger Strikers had just died. Bobby Sands, I think, had been, had Bobby Sands been, de- I think Bobby Sands had been dead about six weeks when we got there. Turf Lodge had been barricaded in. Um, there was no patrols on the streets. Uh, the IRA were running riot, or the Pyro were running riot. Inla were, were shooting people left, right, and centre. And so we went, and I, I'll, I'll never forget, we got off the plane, we got in the back of an MK, we drove into, I was in Fort White Rock on the, on the Ball of Murphy, and um, we got off the back of the trucks, we put on body armour, got our, well, we had our weapons already, drew our ammo, got in a truck and went straight into the Ballamurphy. I've got a good friend, engineer, Mike Adams. He finishes W01, Mike Adams, MBE. Uh, he was the first sort of engineer I'd sort of met, really, driving a big uh, dumper truck. And he drove this dumper truck. In. We didn't know if they were armed or if they were going to be exploding or whatever. And he drove straight into it, cleared the barricades, uh, and we went into the Ballamurphy, and there was the start of six months intensive. Dare I say, enjoyable because I was doing my job. I'd been well trained to do my job. I'd spent the, the previous three months in Strakatho Hospital in in Scotland, uh, putting in drips, treating injuries, working in A and E, uh, working in the operating theatre, tubing people, doing really a lot of extensive medical training for this. Uh, four and a half months tour to Northern Ireland. Um, and it was absolutely, just got on the ground, just really ready for it, you know, and it was, it was really, really good. We, we had our casualties, we had our injuries, but I'm, I'm giving this background because by December 81, you know, we were up for it. Um, because we'd been in Ireland, uh, we weren't doing mountain training and we weren't doing Norway in 82. So we were having this really big, good tour. Um, and then we were having sort of a quiet year. Well, I had a young daughter at this point, so it was nice to spend that quiet year with her. So in the January, to, uh, I went then from Yankee Company. I was Yankee Company's grav medic for three uh, three years, yeah. And I just sort of been moved into support company. So wow, this is great. I'm now support company's medic. And that's what you would aim to, to, to do. This was like this was your opportunity to get on a paddock course and then to go down to work at pool or work with a carder or something like that. So suddenly I was one of these guys that that was chatting to recce troop blocks and having a couple of beers, you know, because they were the ones to be with it in a unit. So um we didn't do 
Norway, we went up to um, north of Scotland doing mountain training in civvies. Could you believe that? Fantastic. No weapons allowed. Uh, we stayed in Cameron Barracks up in, uh, I think, is it Aberdeen? Uh, no, not Aberdeen. The one further north anyway. We went up there in civvies, no weapons, carrying a Bergen, just having a great time, raining a bit and a bit windy, but we had, we had a great time. So the year started off really well. Uh, we got up to Easter. Uh, we had the sick babe run ashore. Um, I'd been drafted, uh, so I was going down to Log Regiment um, after leave, summer of 82. So me and my wife had been packed up the house. All, the house was all in boxes. Uh, she just found out she was pregnant with our second child, which happened to be twins. Um, and that was it. We'd been on the lash, going on leave tomorrow, went home, went to bed, and then on the door at five o'clock in the morning, Janet said to me, what is that about? I said, well, I said, do you know, I've heard that the Argies have landed on the Falklands and I bet it's about this. And she went, I can't be. Anyway, I went down and they said, right, and uh, and then young men, you need it on board. Uh, the transport will be back in 20 minutes. You need to be on that transport. So we went into work and, you know, I think I got home on the Sunday afternoon. This was like Friday, got home Sunday afternoon uh, just to pack the, the last bits of my kit, uh, say cheerio to Janet, who has now got an, an house full of boxes ready to move to Plymouth. And she's moving to Plymouth in like two weeks' time and she's like three months pregnant and um, or more, four months maybe. And um, that was it. Went into work and away we went. And it was literally that quick. So, Paul, just so we understand, you're de- you, you were on your way to Logs, which is Commando Logistics in Plymouth, yeah. but you're still with 4-5 and you've deployed yeah. with 4-5? I didn't. I wasn't leaving 4-5 until like the next day. Mm. And my relief wasn't in until after leave. So I'm leaving on a Friday. We're going on two weeks leave and then my relief will join on Monday, two weeks time. So my relief hadn't joined. I was still there. So because I was still in the unit and we were deploying, away I went. Draft cancelled. Wife in Plymouth. Relief went somewhere else. Mm. In fact, I don't even know who my relief was, to be honest. Can't even, can't even remember now. It's just a life-changing event. Just everything happened so, just so quick. I wonder if your relief appreciated that. Well, he, he would have gone, uh, but it depends who we went with. Mm. And then he didn't relieve me then till probably the September. So yeah. this would have been, this was early April. So it was an extra three months where I spent. It didn't make a lot of difference, to be honest, because if I would have gone down to Plymouth, I would have gone down south anyway, because I would have gone with Med Squadron of Commando Log Regiment. There's still a bit of confusion these days uh, over the, where it was served with. And I, I often have to tell people I was in 4-5. I wasn't in logs at, at that time. Mm. I wasn't even 4-2 either, just because I looked like Sean O'Callaghan. <laughs> so, yeah, away we went. Yeah. How did 4-5, if it's not a stupid question, or for our friends at home at least, how, how did they get to the Falklands? We went down, well, uh, Yankee Company were in Belize. Uh, oh, was it Belize or Brunei? They do jungle training anyway. Because it was a quiet year, so we were going to get all, do all this stuff that we wouldn't normally do. Uh, so they were all, they were in, I think it was Brunei they were in. So Yankee Company, we went minus Yankee Company. We, I think we took their stores, but we went without them. We went down to Portsmouth by coach, which is about a 12, 14 hour trek. And we got on board the Royal Fleet Auxiliary Stromness. And we embarked on that. And the engineers had been on there, the dockies had been on there, and they turned all the, uh, all the store holds uh, into beds and they'd put bunks in there and they put about you wouldn't do it today because of health and safety but I think they must have put about 240 pits in in this one storage area three or four high just enough to slide in there mm. and uh, they packed us all down there took one route in one route out this is the sort of thing that, that we took down the Falklands and uh, you know we, we look at uh, Galahad and Sir Tristan when they got hit and the devastation that caused, could you just imagine what the devastation would have been on Stromness if we would have been hit with all exactly. of those people with, with no escape? Yeah, so we all uh, were loaded onto the Stromness, our unit. Um, and 
various other units and we you know the task force then sailed and i think it was about the 2nd of april 1982 we left portsmouth um we'd all always deployed together before there was nothing really new in that what was new was the ship with we'd used lsls uh, before and dfds uh, seaways to get to norway but we hadn't been on anything like the strong nest before wasn't a lot of space on there obviously um, there was a lot of storage kit for for our personal kit, and of course we had these tiny little sleeping areas. So, um, but do you know one thing Royal does is he makes it work, and um, and we made it work, and aw- away we went. Um, we weren't really, I think, not thinking too much was going to happen. Uh, as was the rest of the country, so we were on. We were on board. We were on our way. Uh, we didn't have comms like they do today. You know, we didn't have internet. We had a, the the news was broadcast by the first lieutenant uh, on a daily basis. So any information we got, we depended on the hierarchy. We didn't have mobile phones. Uh, we didn't have anything. We wrote blueies and we wrote letters. Um, mail was dropped. Mail was picked up. Um, yeah, and away we went down the South Atlantic to um, Ascension Island. We did a lot of kit maintenance. Uh, we used it as uh, as uh, an important period of life in the unit. Uh, we were able to catch up with all our training, all our basic training that we needed to do. Could do a lot of fizz because there wasn't any space. Um, but certainly we could do all our lectures. We could do our Arctic lectures and stuff like that. Um, we did a lot of first aid training. Uh, we were able to, do, we got everything up to scratch so that by the time we got to Ascension, we were just zeroing weapons, doing a bit of uh, big body fizz, you know, a bit of running, uh, speed marching, getting used again to getting the limbs moving over long distances and stuff like that. And uh, some strength training, uh, went for the swim, got a bit of sun. So, yeah, it was all great. So the first part, phase one, well, phase two, rather, getting down to Ascension. It was all good. We had a good rapport going with the ship's company. Uh, everybody was getting on well with each other. Food was all right. Um, yeah, it was good. Mm. Paul, what what weapon does a medic get issued with in, in the Falklands conflict? Well, we felt, and that's a good story, we- weapons, because it got a little bit confusing later on. Um, we had a personal weapon, which was a submachine gun, a sterling 9 mil submachine gun. Bit shaped like a crossbow, but with only one one arm on it. You know where the magazine sticks out. Pretty good weapon. Nowhere near as good as the seven six two SLR. Not as powerful, but for, for us, it was light. It was accurate. A thirty bullets in a magazine, thirty rounds. So, mm. uh, and I was I was pretty good with it. It it, it was easy to use, um, and I could get shots on a target. But it was cumbersome, without a shadow of a doubt. Getting down a scrambled net with an SMG was no fun, particularly if you had a magazine on, because by the time you got down, it probably it, the magazine was released by a little button on the top, and, and anything could catch that, and, it, and the magazine would pop out. Um, but that and everybody's wish, everybody's special forces wish, uh, would be to have a 9 mil pistol, uh, which is the ultimate. And we were promised it. We never got it. Uh, so... SMG was was what we had. Mm. Um, but then what, later, we did get ashore. Uh, uh, obviously, when we were ashore, things change. You know, rules and what you can and can't do. A lot of it goes by, by the by. So uh, somebody had asked me, they were going on a recce or something, and they would rather have an SMG than have an SLR. So they asked me if they could use my weapon. So I, we swapped weapons. So I then ended up with uh, an SLR. Well, a bit late. I'm going to move right forward now to two sisters. My, the the other medic up there, or Zulu Company's medic, was a guy called Mick Nicely. When we were treating casualties on two sisters and and getting rid of them and throwing them on the tran- rearward transport, Mick Nicely lost his weapon. He didn't know where it was, and we felt it had been moved back with the. Uh, equipment belonging to casualties because obviously he needs two hands he's put his slr down with other equipment guys have picked it up and moved it rearward 
So Mick's now not got a weapon. So I gave Mick my SLR, which I had got off someone else, and said, you take that. Um, so I've now not got a weapon. So the RSM said to me, oh, young man, where's your weapon? I was like, uh, well, I'm just, long story, he went, right, well, grab one of those. So I ended up with an Argentinian FN weapon in the end. Uh, so, so, yeah, started off with an SMG, ended mm. up with, a, with an Argentinian did- Paul, did the FN fire the same ammo as the SLR? Seven six two, yeah. Yeah, so it was interchange. Yeah. In they could just use had a folding, the, pretty much the same. Just had a folding stock. Mm. Yeah, I did. I, I, I often wondered about that. It was cumbersome for for a medic. Uh, we all want to go down there and we all want to war fight. But you know, Matt, I, I I did a season with field gun uh, and wanted to run field gun at, at number eighteen, uh, but I was a medic. Uh, and you end up doing so much medicking, there's n- not a lot else you can do. Mm. Um, so we all want to go down and we all want to war fight. But in, in the first seconds of a war fight, you've got casualties. You know, my weapon becomes redundant. Uh, pain, so, pain, in, pain in the ass, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. Geneva Convention says medics should carry the golden 9 mil pistol for protection of himself or his casualties. And that would be the only reason that... Uh, you don't have a non-combatant with the with the Royal Marines, but basically a medic would, like a paramedic, would be non-combatant unless protecting themselves or their or their casualties. Mm-hmm. Tends not to be the not if you're in a fighting company and uh, and there's lots of incoming, um, but that will change when you take your first casualty. Um, and we, we, you know, on on the big battles, we had casualties all the time. So we, the, the medics were really busy, allowing Royal to get on and do what he, what he does best, which is war fighting. Hmm. So that's the that's the weapons story. Yeah. Incidentally, I love the not the um, submachine gun. Yeah, that did, was yeah. it? What was it? Called? It was called the, Was it Sterling? Wasn't it Sterling? It's Sterling, yeah, Sterling yeah. nine mil. The, the thing I loved about it was. Unlike we 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 joined up with the SA eighty high velocity. As soon as you fire it, that mechanism has gone like that. With, yes. You know, faster than the the speed of the eye. But with the SMG, you can physically feel the the mechanism yes. coming back, collecting the next shell, shoving it into the chamber. Boom. But they but did they did say it's that a chunk. It's a chunk. It goes chunk chunk chunk. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. I loved it. I loved it. I reckon the stoppages must have been hu- hu- huge because oh, it's were. pretty outdated. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they did say a wet blanket would stop stop one of those rounds. <laughs> yeah. They, fly, they fire pretty straight. You can hit a barn door with one, I must admit. Mm. Um, and, and you can get a good grouping on it, but what the damage would cause, I, I don't know. You'd probably, you'd probably hit harder with a catapult and a, a ball bearing than you would with a, with a 9mm pistol. Mm. Uh, with a sterling submachine gun. I had a nine mil for a year as well when I did uh, security work on uh, Invincible. Uh, it's a pain in the ass. It's um, you, had, you literally had to sleep with it under your pillow. <laughs> oh yeah, because because you were more worried about losing the bloody thing <laughs> yeah. and getting charged than you were about having to having to use it. Um, yes, good. I, I it, it, when you become a ship's marine, you 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 get to use all the weapons. So we used, yeah, yeah. you know, we, we had S- SLRs and it was great to, to have that experience because I imagine a, a, a lot of uh, Marines subsequently will never get to fire the SLR and it isn't absolutely, that is a weapon. It really is. Awesome. Uh, you know, I carried a pistol on, uh, I was added air crew, extra air crew on 846 uh, Naval Air Commando Squadron during the Gulf War, the first Gulf War. Uh, and and so I had a I had a sidearm then obviously because I was in the back of a cab. Mm. I was a, I was a medic again. I was a, I was a medic. Uh, well, no, I wasn't. I was number two on the on the GPMG. I was number two to the gunner until we got casualties, and then I was a medic. So if we had casualties in the cab, I was a medic, and if we didn't, I was a number two on the gun. Mm. So yeah. I had an interesting life for a medic. It's been really great. Well, we, I can see that, and like I said, friends at home, just just um, do an internet search on on, on Paul, and you're you're going to see some, yeah, some, uh, well, an amazing amazing career. He, um, it's funny, really. When when you know, I get I get the whole SA eighty thing or whatever it's become now, and I get the um, 
was it the M16 that the Americans had and the lightweight ammunition and et cetera, et cetera. But when you fired the SA-80 at 300 meters and there's even the slightest wind, you literally got to like fire off, off the target, which all snipers are going, well, yeah, that's like normal, Chris. Well, yeah, I get that. But with, with the SLR, even with the iron sight, so you didn't have a, an optical sight, over 300 meters, you just. <clears throat> it it was so just heavy. amazing. It really was amazing. And I do wonder, would I, I it, wouldn't it be in track? Well, st stupid boy's own question, but like, how would the Falklands have panned out had they had SA-80s? I'm not saying it would have been well, worse. So I'm, I'm, one I'm just, of the, sorry to interrupt. Mm. Um, the special forces down there and um, the mountain and active warfare card who did a fantastic job without doubt down there, you know, as the advanced sort of recce troop, uh, they were carrying AR-15s, M-16s and SLRs. Um, and, and it was the, they were Gucci, weren't they? An M-16 is a Gucci weapon. It's a bit smaller than an SLR and, and some of them had them. But, but, you know, from what I hear, it just doesn't have the stopping power that uh, a 762 had. And if you got it with an SLR, you weren't going anywhere else. Whereas with an M16, uh, people could continue to act, to perform actions uh, even though they'd been hit. Yeah, a 762, would, if it's you in the arm, it'd set the arm off. Whereas yeah. uh, a 5.56 would probably go through it. Well, that's why the F F SF SG Special Forces Support Group, switched to... 7.62 in in afghanistan did they not yeah because the, the I, I don't know about that but i, I do know that uh, yeah. it's the favored weapon 7.62 yeah they got this well shouldn't call weapons wicked but for the purposes of ballistics i'll say it's wicked it, it's a shorter you know shorter than the slr so friends at home put it in the comments that you, you you know the weapon i'm talking about but um I think they thought that when you had an enemy charging towards you, particularly if they're off their head, head on some substance, that the 5.6, 5, 5.56 just, just wasn't going to stop them coming forward. So they went to the, the heavier round. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's next, Paul? I, I, I obviously. Okay, well, we landed, I think. When did the war start? Well, for us, I think the war started when Sheffield was hit. Uh, we, we, we started off pretty relaxed it built up so we got to ascension built up a bit more and we still weren't sure what was going to happen and then I think when Sheffield went there was no stopping us it, 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 somebody just flicked the switch and it was all systems go and that was it and um, the MLs we were talking about the mountain leaders earlier uh, they hand made uh, assault nets um, uh, scrambled nets they built them by hand using all the rope that was on board to throw over the side of the strong nest so that we could get down onto the uh, landing craft we practiced that at ascension we juggled people around so we got most of our unit together a uh, yankee company that had been in brunei joined us in um ascension so and they were on, on. I think they might have gone on fearless, but anyway, the units were all together. So um, we proceeded south. She we lost Sheffield, uh, and then that was it. And we went down and um, we, we landed. We got off. We got off Stromness using scramble nets, uh, <laughs> which was lots of fun, as you can well imagine. There was one or two people stuck upside down with a foot stuck in the netting or whatever. Just so much kit and equipment, you know, and the cumbersome SMGs around your neck and fighting orders and everything. Because we didn't know what... We had our basic kit. We had all our Arctic kit as well. We had loads of... We had NBC kit as well, would you believe? Uh, we had absolutely everything. Um, but we did the landing um, unopposed, although we, we didn't know. Uh, it was going to be unopposed. Um, we were a bit late. We were ready to go by. So we've been up all night, ready to go by, at, at first light. Uh, things that I remember sailing around a bit in a, in a LCVP. 
uh, and then eventually landing on the Falklands uh, dry. I got sure dry. And then some Argentine aircraft came across. So we took, <laughs> like you do, let's find the first river and get in it. So we've got a shore dry, aircraft comes, jumps in the first river, absolutely soaked. Uh, and that was the way my feet were going to stay for at least the next sort of six weeks. Or certainly not my feet, but my boots were going to stay wet for the next six weeks. I was in, because I was in four or five, because I was in support company, we were using a Hawkins mountain boot. There's all sorts of boots down there. Northern Ireland patrol boots people had, which is a very soft pigskin, beautiful, comfortable boot, but for sprinting around the streets of West Belfast, not for mountain training. Hawkins mountain boots, DMS boots. DMS boots adapted to become a high leg boot so they didn't have to wear putties. Mm. Uh, Greenlanders, which was a mountain leader's specialist boot, which was a mountain boot that you could affix, affix a ski to. So off the top of my head, that's five different types of footwear that people were wearing. I had a Hawkins mountain boot, which was a trialed boot, and I'd been trialing it for about a year, and then we could keep it. So I just wore my mountain boots and hose tops, which are a bit easier to manage than putties. Mm. So, um, yeah, so lots of dubbing on them, lots of polish, lots of wax. But do you know what? Still wet when I jumped in that river. And that was it. And we, we were sure. I'll just say something, Paul. Um, this is going to sound a bit like uh, out of field, but when I've been trekking, and I didn't know this, I went trekking. Um, I took an old army truck to Iceland one time from, from Sweden. It was an old Vo Volvo Viking military truck. It was an incredible trip. We traveled all, all around um, Iceland and we did a bit of a yomp. One time, I think we yomped about 70 Ks over, over two or three days. And what I didn't know, all the other guys I was with, when we got to a river, and you're going to get this a lot when, you, when you're trekking, it, it crosses the, your path and you've you, you got to get wet. They all had uh, like Teva sandals, you know, strap sandals yeah. on, on the side of their rucksacks. And it was just a case of trousers down, Sandals on, wade across, sandals off, trousers back on, put your walking boots dry. I mean, yes. um, hey, military strategists, if you're watching, I do want some money for this, for this tip. But um, I know it sounds a bit silly going ashore in the Falklands in in um, in sandals and, and your boxer shorts, but bloody hell, it would have saved would have saved a lot of casualties, I reckon. It's, it's a worth it, it. It is worth the sort, particularly with sort of trench foot and people with soggy feet. But, you know, we were going to be, we were going to be wet anyway mm. with the terrain, uh, particularly at that time of year. It's, it's the, the terrain is pretty much like um, uh, Dartmoor uh, in, a, in a boggy season. Dartmoor in November, you know, those big clumpy bits of grass that you, the ankle breakers. That's really what it is. Yes. It seemed a, a lot of people fared well down there with welly boots. It was an option, yeah, but because remember, you, you did have Arctic over boots, you had NBC over boots, and people that were like in the rear echelon that we used to wear these big, uh, they, had a, they were ankle boots with a zip, but they were huge rubber wellies, and you could leave your normal boots on and just slip them on over your, their over boots, basically. Mm. And I did notice a lot of the people there, uh, certainly in the rear, were wearing them sort of that sort of stuff. And it's absolute feet savers. So, how did things progress, Paul, after, after you landed? Well, we um, I had my first aid teams that was made up from the uh, chefs and people. And uh, we got ashore. The unit, we set up the RAP, the Regimental Aid Post, uh, in Ajax Bay. And the guys went up into the mountains. And um, they <clears throat> dug their trenches and they got dug in. And then we were now waiting, securing Ajax Bay so that we could bring the loggies in uh, and the field hospital. And Rick Jolly's red and green life machine moved in. Uh, we, we must have been the first medics on there, I think, as the regimental aid post. Not, not many of us. Uh, doctor, dentist, padre, POMA, me five MAs, 
number of bootnecks. My leading hand, Fred Jakes, uh, had been injured on the way down to the Falklands. Uh, he, he'd, he'd slipped and got quite a nasty knee injury, and then a, I think he got a back injury, and he got sent back to UK. Uh, well, no, he didn't. <clears throat> they sent him on Canberra uh, to be reviewed by a doctor, thinking that it was going to be, dare I say, a favour, because I'm in the medical branch. So, boss, can you have a look at my knee? I think it's quite nasty. So he said, yeah, come across. So he went across to Canberra. Doc looked at his knee and said, yeah, this is the problem. Uh, take these pills. And he said, I'm off back. And he said, no, you're not, because you've now entered the Kazavak chain. The Kazavak chain ends in the UK. So poor Fred ended up back in the UK. Of course, we're now a leading hand short, a killick. Uh, so I was the most senior guy being in sport company. So I, I then became the local acting LMA for 4-5 Commando. So I left support company. We bought a, got a battle casualty replacement, Chris Penny, into support company. I went to HQ as the Killick. Uh, so my role changed now. I now left support company. I've gone into the headquarters. So we set up the RAP uh, just off Ajax Bay. <clears throat> the guys were up in the mountains. And we set up and we set up stuff like you do. We set our, we were in a little hut and we set it up as best we could, like a, like a mini stick bay come trauma unit, which was great. Had our trench outside, thought we might just kip in this little hut, which was a good idea till it got dark. And then there was aircraft flying around and we thought, you know what, we're probably not in a good place here. So we then moved out of there and, um, and did the best we could, but without using the building, because it was obviously a target for mm. any Argentine aircraft. <clears throat> but yeah, we were there, we were five, we were all set up, we were ready to go. So 4-5 Commando was now ready to go, sure, armed, ready, uh, ready to go. Um, my first casualty was a the w, antelope was out in um, Frigate Alley, or Bomb Alley as they called it, and the antelope had been hit with a, it had two unexploded bombs on there. And the WO2 um, from the army bomb disposal had gone on there. Two of them had gone on. <clears throat> one had been killed, the other one had been, um, he'd lost his right arm, I think. <clears throat> so because I was working closely with Med Squadron, because we were co-located, I said I would go down on the beach and bring the, bring the casualty up. And he was the first casualty that I brought up. Uh, and he was minus, his arm was still in the sleeve. Um, but he was, he was in quite a bad way. He was obviously he was deeply in shock. So I took him up to the hospital, uh, passed him over to Rick Jolly uh, and his team, his trauma team. And they took him into the dressing station and began to treat him. And there's things we can say now, 40 years later. I don't know if he was the first casualty. Um, but I think it was the first major casualty that they, they'd taken in there. I think it was one officer, John Prescott. Is uh, he, he got um, he got quite a high award for it, Gallantry, mm. Queen's Gallantry Medal or something? I think you can, if you have a look, it, it tells you all about uh, John Prescott. And then stood on the beach and watched antelope uh, blow up and eventually sink. And, and, and for me, that is the reality of war. And I talk to students these days in colleges and universities, and I say, do you know, there are not many people alive that have watched a warship sink. Um, and on the 25th of May, I stood on a beach with a lot of, with some ship's company from Antelope as well. You just watched their whole house, their belongings, uh, everything just sink to the bottom of uh, Fulton Sound. And it was spectacular. And I mean that uh, as descriptive. To watch the, the photographs you see of those explosions going off uh, midships of Antelope were just unbelievable. And also what was unbelievable was the heat and the noise, the, the, you know, boiling, burning, melting metal going into the freezing South Atlantic. Uh, you would just, you can't describe it. You really can't describe it. It is just, it's in there forever. For me, it's like a, 
it's a silhouette. It's all dark. And then right in the middle is the ship with all the, the explosion going on all around it. And then eventually it just broke in half and sank. Mm. That was it. End of Antelope. How many um, fatalities were there following Can, that? Do you know, you've, you've caught me out there. I, I, really, I really don't know. I'd, no. I'd have to research. I'm just thinking, like, you know, it, it, no matter how many there were, it, 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 it's obviously starting to sink home to you guys that this is – this is war. This is this yeah. is what this is what we train for, and and this is why why we're here. I think we were a little bit naive that we never expected. I never expected a ship war. It, it was a, it was always going to be a land war. I never really gave a lot of consideration until, of course, the Sheffield went. Um, but I didn't didn't give it a lot of thought. I thought a lot at that time about those. I mean, I was a sailor ashore who could dig a hole, and, and if I was uncomfortable, I could dig my hole even deeper. Uh, if you're a Matlow on board a ship, there is absolutely nowhere you can go. It must be. I was on uh, Albion on Friday with a bunch of uh, visitors, cadets, and we were talking there about the emergency stations and, you know, the damage repair units, the, the damage repair section on board a warship. And one of the officers was saying that his role was sat in there, uh, just waiting for it to happen. So could you imagine the apprehension of you can hear the aircraft and you're you're just waiting for the bang. And when you hear that bang, you're the person that's got to go and take that damage repair equipment and begin to repair that ship that is now in the damage repaired instructional unit with water flying in, like we spoke about an hour ago, mm -hmm. water flying in at 30 miles an hour and have casualties around. It's horrendous to even think about it. Yes, we we. Uh, I don't know if, if if you saw Paul, but recently we had Mick Fellows on the show. Mick was. Uh, um, oh yeah, I know Royal, the diver. Yeah, ordnance Royal Navy. You know, yeah, clearance clear, clearance diver, bomb disposal, and uh, he talked. Um, he talked about the two. The um, sorry, was it was it John Phillips and John Prescott? Uh, oh, sorry, it's John Phillips. Yeah, not John Prescott. John Phillips was the, the John Phillips was the guy that lost his arm, wasn't it? Yes, I think it was. Um, uh, John John Phillips lost his arm. Yeah. I think his star sergeant was John John uh, Jim. Sorry, Jim Jim Prescott. Right, um, yeah, he's the one that was killed. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, you the know, door, we, the it, door blew off. Just un unreal. Um, and, and how old were you, Paul, again? Remind us. 23. So just a lad, you know? Yeah, but I, I, I had had some excellent... Uh, I, I'd had 30 weeks really good medical training in Stonehouse. I'd done my old arms commando course. I'd done what we call a combat casualty care course where I went off into hospitals and was putting drips in people's necks and their arms and their legs and uh, intubating them whilst they were asleep in the operating theatre. I was practising putting IV fluids in, worked in casualty. Um, uh, I think that was a uh, that could have been a two-week course, the advanced casualty care course. And then, of course, all of my Northern Ireland training, and then my time in Ireland. So I was, I, I was for the first time, well, second time, I was doing what I was being paid to do. Mm. I was, I'd seen dead people. I'd seen severely injured people. I'd seen how people react when they've been given drugs. Um, J John Phillips had had morphine. Um, that's interesting. We talk about when you give morphine, write an M on the forehead so everybody can see it and the time. And people think, ah, that's just, it, ha it happens. And when you see somebody with an M on the forehead and the time, you think, ah, right, you know, it does, the system does work. Mm. And and he did have an M on his forehead, and I don't know if it had the time on there. I can't can't quite remember now. Yeah, I've never really um, understood that people have different tolerances, don't they? You know, one dose of, well, uh, uh, of morphine. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. One dose to a big lad, he might be like, ooh. One yeah, dose yeah. to another guy could could be off his head, borderlining on. Um, on the, you know, stopping breathing. Uh, yeah, fun. fun. We, we, things were very different then, though, as well. We, we were very, um, 
th there was a fear of controlled drugs. And we were very reluctant to use morphine uh, because of the addictive qualities. Uh, the, the way that morphine works, it suppresses the brain uh, or it suppresses pain. Uh, it has an effect on the brain. It affects shallow breathing. Uh, it's highly addictive. So we've got this fantastic drug as a painkiller that people are really reluctant to use because everybody says, don't use it if they've had a snake bite or if they've got a head injury or if they've got an abdominal injury. And guys are going, well, what's the point of carrying it, to be honest? But it's a really, really effective drug. Today, they'll, they'll give it first. You know, they'll use morphine rather than use an aspirin or something because, maybe not an aspirin, but because it's a really powerful drug. And I don't think, and you will know more about this than me, but if you're in pain and you take morphine, um, it's hardly social. You, you, you know, you're not going to get that addictive element uh, because you've used it for painkilling because it's associated with something not very good. Mm. Um, and the other thing that we had down there with morphine was the cold uh, and it being absorbed. So casualty, get some morphine, somebody else... He's still in pain. Somebody else gives him a morphine. Somebody else gives him a morphine. So he's now, somebody said to me, Doc, he's had three morphines. And I said, in, in what time? And they said, oh, five minutes apart. I was like, you know, that could, that could kill him. But yeah, but he's still in pain, which was fine because he was still cold. But when he starts to get warm and it all begins to circulate, suddenly we've got a massive impact of, of three vials of morphine that he's been given for pain relief. So it does cause problems for the and of course it also makes you uh, can make you feel quite nauseous. And if somebody's injured, uh, we don't want them being sick if they're like not able to manage their airway. So there's lot, lots of reasons why there was a reluctance to use it. Yeah, now it's the, the other thing, it was in a little tiny little toothpaste tube with a pin in it. In a, in a glass file, and they, we said, wear it on your dog tags. And they put it on their dog tags with black masking tape. So I'm trying to treat a casualty, asking him for his morphine, and I can't get his morphine off because he's got three foot of bloody masking tape wrapped around it. And, and, and these were the sort of problems with people losing them. Uh, they, they were cumbersome. It, there's got to be a better, well, an EpiPen has got to be the answer, a morphine EpiPen. Mm. In your on your sleeve here of your combat jacket uh, so that everybody can get access to it and just take the lid off and, and do it. But we were using toothpaste tubes because I suppose it was maybe left over from the war or summer, from the war, I'm talking about uh, 3945, <laughs> which is where a lot of our dressings and equipment came from. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's how sort of backward we were in coming forward in 82. In one of the books I read recently, Paul, I've read some... Fascinating books on the folk. Well, yeah, fascinating books on the Falklands. Uh, um, a couple written by Paras, who who we've had on the show. Um, I can't remember which one it was. I'm not sure if it's Nigel Spud Eli's, but the battle for um, Goose Green. But in the end, they got some of the guys were in such a bad way with the with cold injuries that they were just prick, pricking themselves with their own morphine. Um, and if you think that's what some people will do for a night out, then <laughs> you can, it's, it's, uh, you know, you can see where that, you can see where that, uh, why, why people would do that. Um, just in, instant euphoria, you know, yeah. take, takes you out of the battlefield, takes you above all your problems in in it's first, instant first pain. Of heard of that. Yeah. First I've heard, I must admit, um, the issue we, we I had was getting people to use it. Uh, fit, raw marine, injured, in pain. I give it a morphine. They go, no thanks. I, I want to know what's going on. Um, oh. I, so, so a lot of them wouldn't use it. Mm. Yeah, but interesting. Mm. So there, there's the um, th there's my first casualty. Um, Took him from the landing craft into the back of the ambulance and uh, took him up and passed him across to Rick Jolly. No, no blood. Uh, he said to me, interesting story. He said to me, I'll talk to him this year about this, this event. 
and put him in the back of the ambulance. He won't remember any of it because obviously he was he was out on morphine. But I said to him, uh, what injuries have you got? And he said, my arm is off. And I said, OK, which one? And he said, the one you're leaning on. Because remember, he's still in his combat jacket mm-hmm. and he's still got two hands. And I'm leaning, as I'm leaning across, he said to me, the one you're leaning on. So he's obviously felt me leaning against his chest. But, and I said, oh, what, this one? He said, yeah, yeah. I, he said, it's off at the shoulder. I said, is it really? What, what did I say to him next? Can you move your fingers? He said, no, my arm is off. And I said, okay, fine. And he, said, he was right, his arm was off, but it was still in the jacket. Mm. There was no blood. There was no... It's not like in a film where there's blood gushing everywhere. But no, he was a very relaxed, pleasant, polite man, pale, big M on his forehead, uh, with with a severe uh, arm injury. Amazing. Beyond beyond words. Beyond words. Lots of things I saw were were strange. That we're brought up with this image that you're going to see. made by Hollywood uh, or by the BBC. And a lot of the time you don't see that at all. It's unexpected. I, a, f- a friend of mine, um, I later in the war, I'd gone, they said, Paul, can you go get a casualty? There's one coming in by uh, Hilo. And uh, so I went up to meet the Hilo and um, my mate jumped off. So I went, oh, hello, Phil. Shook his hand and that. We, we had a quick chat. And um, he said to me, what are you doing here? I said, oh, there's a casualty coming in. He said, oh, that'll be me. I said, what, what do you mean? He went, oh, uh, somebody's cleaning an LMG and a ram went off and it's gone through my bicep and it went through his bicep and out the other side. And he was just, he wasn't bleeding. He was just stood there. He had it all in his combat jacket and you could you could have probably put your finger right the way through. But he was he was he, he was a mountain leader and he was like, not a big issue. Just you know, put a bandage on it. <laughs> it takes a little bit more than that when you get a seven six two round through because it destroys all the internal muscle, etc. But um, but yeah, they're the sort of things that you see. So it's the reality is very different from from the norm. Well, if I can ask you, Paul, when you the famous thing that's always said is, uh, is Surgeon Captain Rick didn't lose uh, a single person. Argentine or, or or British, um, that that almost seems like hard. Uh, uh, I'm not saying it's not true, but that seems really hard to believe, doesn't it? In the guys that were coming to you, were just much, some of them must have been so torn up. Yeah, they. Um, th- this was in the red and green life machine. Th- th- this was in the complex itself. Yeah. Uh, that nobody died in that complex. And this was an, an old, what was it, like an old sheep shed with a with a, yeah, it was a cross on top? It's a refrigeration plant. Okay. It was just a big, empty refrigeration plant. Mm. Um, very dusty. I, re- I remember helping Metzquad, going down to help Metzquad when they landed and sweeping it out, and it was just dust everywhere. You, you know, you just couldn't shit. The dust just wouldn't settle. Uh, but it was ideal. It was dry and it was big. And it certainly saved putting the tentage up on, on rough ground, you know. So it, it was an ideal situation um, for them to be in. And they could screen areas off and they had operating theatres and, and all this uh, sort of stuff. Mm. Uh, well, that that story leads us on then to the 27th of May uh, when, the, when the hospital complex was bombed. Now, earlier I alluded to uh, training first aid teams. Uh, and first do first day training. Well, I had a first day team that were made up of chefs, and those four, four people were uh, Corporal Stix Evans, a uh, uh, chef, Marine Paul Callan, uh, Marine Tug Wilson, and a guy called Tony Owen. And these were my four medics, my sort of stretcher bearers. These were the guys who were going to help me on the ground with the casualties. So my biggest, well, not my biggest concern, one of my concerns was what if I get hit? So if I get hit, I need these guys to be able to do the business correctly and to a great level. And, um, and so you can imagine the level to which we'd train them. Uh, these guys could put drips up and they could do all sorts of stuff. And we've really got to know each other during that, that trip down. So on the 27th of May, 
we, 4-5 Commando, were going to move out of the beachhead to Teal Inlet. So the unit went. But I'm now the LMA in charge of the medical stores of the regimental aid post. We can't move on foot because I've got tentage and medical stores. So we were going to move later. So the unit went. And we've stayed, and I that day I we were communal eating. That meant that all my my four chefs that I've just mentioned were working in the main galley complex, helping out Commando Log Regiment. And to save on rations, there was communal food. So we went down. We split our team up, our RAP team. The chefs were working in the galley. Um, we split up the RAP team. So I went for scram first. I went down for scram. Actually, I had it last night, chicken, curry and rice. Funny how you remember what you eat on certain days, isn't it? But that day, it was chicken, curry and rice. And upside down pineapple cake and custard. And a mug of tea. And I'd gone down there and I had had my scram. And um, chatting away like you do, I thought, shit, Colin Jones needs to get down for this scram. So Colin Jones was the PO. So I ran up to the RAP about 150 yards away. I said to Colin, Colin, you go and get your scram and, and I'll stay here. So I was, I was a smoker at the time. I was having a smoke. I think Colin had had his scram and come back. That's right. So Colin and now was now back. RAP stuff. I was having a smoke, stood in the doorway, and I saw four sky, four, I don't know my numbers. I saw Skyhawks flying over 40 commandos position on the other side of the sound. And I said to Colin, go look at that. They're going to get a batter in. And uh, so I saw these aircraft go. And then I tell you what, mate, within seconds, uh, those Skyhawks were over us and they dropped their payload. And and I was just having a, a smoke and I thought, I can't believe this. They flew straight over the dressing station, the field hospital, where all the ammunition was stored around there as well. That's why there was no red crosses on it, because we were in a stores compound and there was ammunition there. And they dropped their payload on the uh, thing. And well, we... We dived straight into our trenches, waited for the first few bangs and explosions, and then uh, ventured up to have a look what was going on. And the, I remember seeing bombs with parachutes on, floating down, landing on the ground. There was little, little poof, poof going on all around us. And, and this was these retired bombs dropping into the, into the ground. There was fires, there was explosions. Um, and it had blown mortar bombs. So mortar bombs are in their cases, had been blown, and the mortar bombs are now flying through the air and landing in the peat. And that was this noise we could hear of not going off. Mm. They've just been scattered by the, by the various explosions. So when it was reasonably safe and the aircraft had gone we thought we'd get out and have a look. So I, the doctor in the PO stayed, it was this massive trench, as you can imagine. The doctor in the PO stayed in the trench and I, I climbed out to see what was going on. And um, first person saw was one of my uh, first day team, Tony Owen, come running towards him, he was covered in blood. Um, sort of quite a bit of shouting going on. Uh, obviously couldn't hear anything because he'd been caught, he's dazed, he's caught in the explosion, dragged him out. Put him in the trench with the doctor and the and the PO, and um, and I went down to the dressing station to see if there was any casualties there there that I could treat. Absolute mayhem, as you can imagine. Uh, the hospital is trying to function while it's just been bombed. Uh, there's medics and marines doing first aid all, all over the place, and um, yeah, really quite a serious situation here again. So we've just. The day before we watched, or a couple of days before we watched Antelope Sink, now the Argies have just bombed our dressing station. A uh, number of people killed. Uh, people killed their uh, Corporal uh, Sticks Evans was killed out of my team, my team of four. Tony Owens already wrote off with a uh, head injury. Um, Sticks is dead. Tug Wilson is dead. Paul Callan has got a really nasty abdominal injury. Um, Paul Callan was a sailor before he became a Marine. Mm. Uh, so he, quali- he couldn't get in the Marines, joined the Navy, qualified as a sailor, and then went back to Limpston, did the commando course, and then became a chef, came to 4-5, came down as part of my first aid team. Paul Callan's now got a big injury in his belly. It was uh, uh, Paul- Sorry? 
Paul, Paul was on the chef's team that made the, uh, the uh, Queen Diana's birthday. Yeah, uh, the, the wedding cake. The cake, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, we, and it was a really good-looking fella, uh, blonde, blondy, sort of curly hair. A really scouser, a Mancunian, you know, we had a great rapport, me and Paul. Anyway, uh, he was looked after by the medics because he had this uh, big hold. I remember seeing the casualties laid up. Jim Stalabras was there. Uh, he's a cliff leader, you know, the ML that you hate when you're mountain training, throwing you off cliffs. He had a big piece of metal stuck in his ass. <laughs> yeah, that made me smile, I must admit. Serves you right. But he was fine. Uh, my sergeant major, uh, James Gibson, he had a hole in his chest. Uh, he'd had took shrapnel in his chest. Next thing was Paul with the belly ring. I'd said to him, he said he'd be fine with us. We'll look after him. Um, and then the, the, there was Spot Watson, uh, our uh, in friend of mine, sergeant, in sergeant, head injury. I was, I'd treated him. And, remember an explosion because people go deaf. They can't hear anything and they can't see anything. And they're terrified and they're, they're trying to scream, but they can't hear anything. So, it, it, it's really quite frightening, uh, and and uh, the spot was a little bit like that. We had to re- really just calm him down and really deal with him by touch. Things you don't think about as a medic, but if he could touch, if you could touch him and he could feel you, he felt safer than he did in this black world where he can't hear or see anything. Um, so, but anyway, Paul was Paul. So I've lost one seriously injured, two dead. And Paul has got this belly wound. Well, they took Paul then, treated him, took him on to Canberra, where he was um, obviously extremely ill. They give him lots of, you know this story, I think, give him lots and lots of blood. Became the, the idol for all the, the nurses. You know, they all had a crush on him and everything. He was just a, a great bloke. And then sadly, he passed away uh, on Canberra. And they were going to bury him at sea. Was it Canberra or did, what's the other... Was it, uh, yeah, Uganda, wasn't it? Uh, Uganda, he died on, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, they were going to bury him at sea, but they said, we, we, didn't want that. we don't want that to happen. Um, so Rick Jolly organised for him to be taken ashore. And he, so they took him ashore and buried him ashore. Mm-hmm. So there, there's an example of, of one guy who didn't die in the red and green life machine, but did die later, but in, um, on, a, on board a ship. Who ended up back mm. in, in in the same location as his mates? Excuse me, one second. Okay, friends, uh, so, I, sh- I should just say here that I'd uh, someone that was very close to Paul. I, I, I'm not going to give their details out because I don't know if they'd want me to or not. But sure. they um, they contacted me, and um, this is how I became familiar with this story. It's just just all my love and respect to you. You know who you are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was really sad for everybody. They, they were all really sad, but Paul Callum was a it was a particular one that stays. stays. I met, uh, I spoke to Paul's brother and his nephew uh, this year, actually in four or five at the at, at the reunion. Mm. So yeah, so now I've I've tra- I've spent six weeks training my my medical team, and now I've not got any uh, because obviously Tony Owen was, was Kazakh. I met him again this year. First time in 40 years at a 4 5 reunion, which was amazing. So I've now got to find me some medics, uh, some some Royal Marine medics that's going to gonna help me. So um, we flew off and joined the unit at, at, at Teal when I had to then manage to get hold of a load of um, some MT guys and some chefs and, uh, and begin to train them. But there was some concern that... They lacked a little bit of the experience that that we really needed, um, that I needed, because I need people. If I, if I ask for something, that person's got to be able to identify it and give it me, or put a tourniquet on without my direction and stuff. So, but I tell you what, the guys that I got with were absolutely fantastic. We got Marine Dougie Duggan from Med Squadron. He, he got mentioned in dispatches, Dougie, for the, some of the medical work that he did. And another fella called Cavs Cavana, a driver. And I said to Cavs, Cavs, all I want you to do is stay next to me and have handy a pair of scissors. And, and that's what he did. And on, on Two Sisters, he was able to run drips through. He was able to do everything for me and even set up a drip himself if needed. 
And that these guys were fancy. Can I explain how great these fellas were? Calm, uh, professional, and they just did everything that was asked of them. They were they were fabulous. So away we went, and um, it was just sort of routine stuff. Then I, it was then right there, Paul. Get all your kit on and your medical kit. Uh, polish your boots and uh, on your way. And so I joined them. I didn't, I probably one of only about eight people that didn't complete the whole yomp across the Falklands because I I had to go in a helo from uh, Ajax Bay to Teal. And I joined them at Teal, but I did the rest. I uh, don't think you missed much, mate. What, on that first bit? <laughs> I'm yeah, saying well, I was... don't, don't feel you missed something there. <laughs> Yeah, I was a little bit busy where I stayed with what, what I was doing, yeah. Mm. But, uh, but yeah, away we went. And then, then I sort of spent the time just looking after people with um, like bad feet, twisted ankles, all that sort of stuff. Uh, when, I think I've think been in Teal about... I remember that getting there. The, I think the, the pressure I might be given is that suddenly life becomes... What, what at home, if there's an incident... It is everything, but for us, there now in the thick of it, just normal. It's a, it's a normal day at the office, mm. you know. Oh, someone's sort of broke his ankle. All right. Well, if it happened at home, you're dialing nine 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 and you're stopping all the transport and the, and you're getting the ambulance through to the hospital in a in a in a blue light. But when you're there, it's just a normal day at the office. We broke his like, all right, we'll sort that out. Mm. And. Um, if people injured themselves, cut themselves, or if people were, were injured, we would just deal with it. And they would, nine times out of ten, they'd just get on with it. And they'd go, yeah, cheers, thought, and, and away they'd go. Mm. Didn't have any niceties with us. We weren't able to carry niceties. Uh, you know, if they had a cold or they were feeling bad. I don't remember a lot of people sort of being, even though it was cold, I don't think we had the viruses and the bacteria and stuff down there uh, that would make us feel unwell. So I think people generally were were fine. Hungry because we didn't have a lot of food. Uh, I can't remember what we drank. I think melted snow some of the time. Um, we didn't have a lot of food, and we 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 were moving in the end on bare essentials. Uh, and we left our large packs to be brought forward by helos. Atlantic conveyor got hit. We needed the guns forward, and so our kit takes low priority. So we're now we've got a fighting order. Um, and whatever's in that fighting order to keep us going. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it was a bit of a struggle. I think they should make a rule in the commandos. Never get sleep separated from your sleeping bag and bivy bag. Well, we have that rule, don't we? And they say they never get separated from your kit. But We had we, it in we Norway, were... though, Paul. In Norway, you'd yeah, sit yeah. down for a five-minute smoke break that would suddenly turn into hours on hours and you didn't have your Bergen because it was on the back of a bloody BV and you yeah, didn't yeah. see it again for another. This, uh, this was very rare folks. We're not, I'm not trying to say that the military is that unprofessional, but in the Falklands, if they said, right, lads, ditch your kit, you know, chuck it on this beat. I'll be it now. I'm, I'm keeping my sleeping bag and bivy bag because to, to, to try to sleep out what what's essentially an Antarctic night. <laughs> Or, or, or pretty bloody close to the Antarctic Circle, um, and and the paras. Uh, 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 well, no, no, no I mean the, the the paras for two commando. They all slept on those mountains without yeah. with very minimal kit pool. Yeah. Some of yeah. some of them for like three nights, just just hugging your bloody oppo to stay alive. It's yeah. it, it it really is beyond belief. Just beyond beyond belief yeah yeah but you know it, it happened didn't it it was just the way it was just the way that it was mm. can you Paul can you tell us about two sisters and where where were you when this attack was being put in but um well the lead up to that again they sent record patrols out and I was involved with the um with the blue on blue and I, and I know that you've spoke to Andy Shaw haven't you on a podcast yes wonder, wonderful gentleman yeah yeah uh, I went out to the aftermath of that um, of that blue on blue. Mm. Probably the scariest part um, of, of the war for me that 
um, uh, purely because we were trying, in order to go and get the casualties and the and the repatriation of the bodies, um, it, it was very difficult because we went through so many different unit lines, and uh, my I the four four friends of mine in the back of a BV um, that were being repatriated, and I didn't particularly want to sit in the back of the BV with four bodies of my mates. Um, so I travelled on the roof on a on a cloudless, starlit, freezing cold night. Uh, I sat on the top of the BV, which is a common thing to do. You know, it wasn't anything special. It's a common thing that we do. Um, but I was very scared that night going through the, like the Paris lines and different unit lines, thinking that if we were mistaken for Argentinians, particularly as we were in a vehicle, um, it was dodgy. So um, I was thank very thankful to get back, I must admit. Uh, and that was the night before, that was like the 10th. And, and then this, so the assault went in the, the morning of the 11th. I now have got my new medical team with my sergeant, Sergeant Taff Cornish, a uh, mountain leader. And the other team had uh, Sergeant Sandy Kingston, who was a sergeant chef uh, in, in charge of their me medical section. It's interesting for watchers, although I say a sergeant chef, Royal Marines are Royal Marines first. So he, he know, he's got all his patrolling skills and all his weapon skills and everything uh, because he's Royal Marine first and then obviously he's, he's a chef second. Uh, so he's perfectly capable of managing that, uh, that section. Uh, and so we, the, the start, they got on the start line, they started the battle uh, and I, me and my team, I went with the RSM. And when we hit the ground, there was already casualties on the ground. So therefore, uh, I, there was no requirement for me to uh, use my weapon at this point. So I was straight in, finding casualties, treating casualties, identifying dead, um, and making sure we knew where those uh, dead personnel were. Uh, and we went up on to Two Sisters, and I... The first person I met was Mick Nicely. Uh, he was the medical assistant for Zulu Company, who just said, uh, you can imagine what he said to me, but there's all sorts of shit going on here, Paul. I've got casualties there, 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 there. So we looked at his casualties, prioritised his casualties. Uh, I'd already identified some dead and wounded on the way. Um, and then we we got a message out that if that we could get casualties in one place where we could treat them, then that is what we would do. So we got as many casualties down as we could, got them together, treated them. Uh, and then when that was all done, we went and we repatriated the dead and brought all the dead to, well, I say all the dead. There was four, uh, there was four dead from the unit that we had to repatriate and bring back and put together. I had, uh, there was a particularly bad injury that Mick was dealing with uh, involving a, a head injury where, remember we spoke about intubating earlier, we were considering whether we should, needed to intubate, i.e. put a tracheotomy into this, this fellow, uh, sorry, we, we had to consider intubating, putting a tube down his throat into his lungs or whether we needed to put a trachea in. Um, but there were good, reasonable signs of life and he, it appeared he could maintain his own airway. So I then called in a Charlie Charlie call sign uh, of an aircraft and a, a scout, army scout came in and said, what do you want? And we said, we've got to get these casualties away. And um, he's, he asked me to prioritise. And I said, if this one goes, I need to go with him. If, you do, if I don't go, then these, these will need to go. But I need to come back. And they said, OK, fine, we will take the more, most serious injured. And um, so we loaded him onto the back of the aircraft. Uh, I got in because I was like maintaining the airway and looking after the injury and, and managing the IV bottles and stuff. And um, there's no, no room for the air crew. What's he going to do? He, st he stood on the skids and clipped on. Uh, I've never seen this before. And uh, it clipped on either side. So he flew on the skids. Uh, and I was sort of at the head level. And because of the wind and stuff, he, he opened his jacket and put the guy's head inside his jacket. 
uh, as we were, as I was sort of working on his airway and, and on his head. I just brought my family back from Disney World and I went on all the rides there at Disney World, you know, and I never had a ride that similar that I could even describe as flying on that scout from Two Sisters Mountain down to the um, RAP, uh, we, you know, just above ground level, uh, mountain flying, uh, doing all sorts of weird, with a guy stood on the skids, me thinking I'm going to fall out because the doors were open. I'm thinking I'm going to fall out. And if I fall out, and you know, Kazakh is coming with me. But uh, yeah, no, we managed, we managed to get him back. Uh, I then jumped out, threw as much med kit in the back of the, the, the uh, aircraft as I could and went back out onto the uh, back out onto Two Sisters, where uh, there's all hell shit going on. You know, there's bullets and bombs and shit flying everywhere rounds coming from us rounds coming from them uh, but did you know that these pilots they get in there and they do the business it's unbelievable it sounds like you were all doing the business paul it's just well we have a saying they, they say the team works and you know the team does work uh, because it all comes together and um you know a, a lot of the casualties uh were, were already treated uh, because their buddies would treat them as best they could. Mm. Um, and so we, we also, because of the cold, the, the intravenous fluids that, you know, obviously they would freeze in a med pack. So we asked the guys to carry them. We, we asked them to carry them inside the jackets, which is a big ask when they're going into war. But they did have them and they did have giving sets somewhere in their Bergen or on their fighting order, uh, or in this case, on the, in a pooch. Uh, because we couldn't carry the amount of kit we needed. So guys would say, or that they would treat their oppo and leave the stuff there by the side of them. So I could get there and then put the needle in and then put the giving set up and, and then attach the fluid, which they'd left for me. It's, mm. it, it just worked. It worked like absolute clockwork. Um, so there wasn't a lot, there were serious casualties we, you know, we had to deal with. And, and the unfortunate job of dealing with the, those that had been killed. Mm. Um, and and then, it, then it happens, and we got the casualties away, and we got the dead away, and then we regrouped, and we thought about some food and getting warm and some sleep, and then we got ready just then for the next phase. My mate took two sisters. Um, H... The stuff he told me is just, and, I, and he didn't tell me very much, but he said when he moved off the start line, he says a big row of fucking helmets. <laughs> he said, or everyone had just been, been their helmet and put their green lids on. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, this is something else that people aren't fully aware of. And... A Royal Marine berry is very distinctive. And as a silhouette, it's very distinctive. And it's important that people wear it because they can identify each other. You can't identify an individual in a helmet from a regiment, but you can with a Royal Marine and his green berry on. Um, and so I think it's important. I can't remember. I think one of the photographs I sent you, I'm stuck in the middle with a, with a tin hat on. I think that was purely for the photograph because I don't think I wore a tin hat after that. I think I wore my Betty all the time. Um, the, the guys uh, involved in the blue and blue, you will, uh, well, you might not know this, but they actually, I think they took the Bettys off and put beanies on. So the silhouette when they were seen was, was people wearing beanies. And at the start of all of the conflict, when, when the Argentinians first caught the Royal Marines at Moody Brook, Mm. They were wearing beanies, yeah, beanies and yeah. it be became obvious that the Argies were wearing beanies. So I, I, I do wonder, and I've never spoke to Andy Shaw about it or whatever, but I do wonder that if them guys that night would have had green beddies on, maybe there might have been a different outcome. I don't know, because it was dark, so you can't tell. But um, Yes. Yes, it is what it is, mate, isn't it? War. Let's, it is, not, yeah. let's not pretend that war just isn't utterly, utterly, utterly hideous and there's no bloody, well, there are some rules, but... It's in, brutal. Absolute in, brutal. But, you know, 25 years later, I 
was in Afghanistan with 4-2 Commando. People said to me, you know, what was it like compared, the Falklands compared to um, Afghan? You can't compare, there's no comparison. We, we, we had different systems, we had different war fighting techniques, we had different equipment, uh, but Afghan was brutal, absolutely brutal. We knew the enemy were in, in the Falklands. You know, it was conventional warfare. Mm. Um, but, yeah, Afghan was very different. Would you say, Paul, um, I'm not talking about the, the casualty rate now, but I'm talking about the fact that you have a patrol base that you patrol out of, you don't want to get blown up and you don't want to get sniped at, and you're doing the civ pop thing, you know, hearts and might. That, to me, seemed... It seemed very similar to Northern Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but conditions obviously very different. Uh, weapon systems a lot different. And the enemy a lot different. Uh, you alluded to earlier, you, you know, when you've got guys that are high on all, all sorts of sort of stuff, you, you know, that really don't know what they're doing. And, and uh, I've got to say air cover, so I sound like I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, obviously, yeah. They, they big big air cover in, uh, or, um, in, in the Middle East. Didn't have that so much in, uh, was it Girdwood Park? Um, yeah, Girdwood was one, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we didn't have any in uh, White Rock either. Yeah. My, I, we, oh, we no, we pat- might have had a couple of helicopters. Yeah, we patrolled out of White Rock. Um, that was our first uh, posting over there because we were the, called the Commando Reserve. Right. And so we, we uh, I'll never forget that first patrol at dawn out of White Rock. I don't. Even, I couldn't tell you what that road is because we moved about two weeks later. Um, but you just—it's a Mona bypass. Yeah, Mona bypass. We just bomb burst out of there. Everyone zigzagging, broke into patrol formation. Then I can. We had what can only be described as a week, possibly two of the most boring patrols I think you could ever go on. I mean, they were long and it was a really hot summer, 89. It was, it, they called it the, the long, hot summer patrolling from RUC station to RUC. And they used to give you the, you could just go up to their machine and get milk and juice and, and, um, and uh, stopping the odd player and, and, you know, giving them a bit of a grilling, can we say, or at least a, a, a bit of a chat. And um, I tell you what, uh, complacency is the word that comes into my mind, right? Because you've done all this training, this absolutely, you know, high adrenaline training to get to there where things you, you're actually training with live ammunition and shooting. We were shooting moving targets on the range, everything. And then, of course, you get over there and, and for two weeks, it's like nothing. Like nothing, honestly. It was like, have we are we like wasting our? Is this something people aren't telling us? Bang! That second week, it just we we got we got moved to Girdwood, Girdwood for one um, token patrol. It changed everything, Paul. Changed everything. Everything started going bang. Rounds started coming down. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm not sure how we got onto subject of Northern Ireland, but but no, it, when you mentioned earlier that you were at White Rock, that that I was, I was something t- thinking. Oh, so glad we went to get. We stayed the rest of our time there at Gird Rock, and I'm so glad we did. Patrols were shorter. There were sometimes like two hours, maybe at long at length four, poss- possibly six. Uh, but White Rock, that was long all day long patrols go out in the morning come back in the evening uh, oh yes <laughs> that's what life's about yes yes Chris, t- time has really moved on and i've hey I've really Paul, I, I am thoroughly aware that we have covered just a tiny bit of yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, of your career mate uh, your life your 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 career it's been absolutely fascinating i i think our friends at home are just um going to appreciate you so much um um coming on the, on 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 the show 
I don't really know how to close other than what I always say, which is just massive respect for. Thank you. For, um, you know, for all, all, all your service, mate, and, and, and the lives that you must have saved. Um, extend that respect, obviously, to everybody that went went down south. And um, we and, and Paul, you are very humble, but you were mentioned in dispatches. Um, I happen to know you have a, a, a rack of medals that um, uh, la- that go from here to eternity. So you, you're a ve- very humble man here, folks. And should we give the um, should we just say something about um, Rick Jolly before we before we finish? Because he was he certainly touched a lot of hearts, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, absolute great bloke. I've, uh, Rick Jolly did so much for the branch, for the medical branch, uh, for the commando medical branch, because he was a, a, a commando trained surgeon lieutenant in 4-2 commando, did a lot of Northern Ireland tours. He used to he used to have some photographs that he would indoctrinate us before our tours, where it would be the, the, the Rick Jolly Happy Horror Show, uh, where he would show us photographs and, and explain how best to deal with situations out there. And, and he really became the man of the commando medical branch. Uh, without choice, he was the guy that was going to lead us uh, down there. And I, and I say lead, and he did lead, and he did pull those of the red berry and those of the green berry together and said, do you know what, fellas, if this is going to work, you need to cut out this shit and we need to work together. And, um, and and that's the bit of Rick Jolly that, pe- having said that, he was six foot four, solid, <laughs> huge rugby player. Do you know what I mean? He, he, wasn't, uh, he, he wasn't no weakling, uh, but he got them all together and he sorted them out and, and he led uh, from the front. And he was absolutely great bloke. And um, I used to see him regularly and we'd, we'd have a beer and we'd have a chat and we'd talk about old times and that. But yeah. What a great bloke and what a sad loss. And is is the only sailor I know that when at his funeral, he was carried by four Royal Marines that were Marines of his in Ajax Bay. And anybody would have wanted to, to do that. You know, Sam wanted to do it. The Navy wanted to do it. Is The doctors, everybody wanted to be pallbearers. But do you know what? Four Royal Marines, four Royal Marines did it. Uh, and that's the respect he had for the Royal Marines, and it was the respect that he had for the for the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines as well. So yeah, fabulous blood. Sorely yeah. missed. I was with his wife, uh, who was doing very well at the Falklands Memorial Service earlier this year in in Plymouth. Susie, yeah, she's doing well. Good, good, great. Paul, listen, let's let's get you on the show again because I know you've got a million more. There yeah, it goes, you can, mate. You, you, can, you can spin us. Just, just, just one last question. H- how have you coped with all the trauma, Paul? Have you always, you know, have have you have you struggled at all? Did you hit the bottle at any point, or, or you know? when when I first got back, uh, I used to like to listen to Royal Marine band music late into the night. Maybe have a couple of whiskeys, but um, that was that. Uh, but no, because. Because to me, the uh, I, I, at the moment I've got eleven medals. Um, the Falklands is the second one, so there are a series of things after that. So I I was never able to dwell on it. I it was like those that served and left maybe have one or two issues. Uh, I stayed in, and because I stayed in, uh, my experiences have changed over the years. Mm. Uh, the, the most the, the, the one that upset me the most I think was uh, in Afghan with 42 possibly because I'm a lot older and because of the people that were dying were a lot younger uh, I suffered a little bit with that I worked closely with the with the colonel with, with fatalities uh, so I was involved a little bit more with the aftermath of fatalities but mm. other than that you know enjoy a good day and a good beer and a good rum good. now and again yes well, let's have a, a run together soon, mate. All right, mate. Definitely. That's been fabulous. Thank you. Paul, Great just, chatting to you. Yeah, stay on the line just so I can um, say goodbye to you properly. But thank you so much, Paul. Friends at home, if you could like and subscribe and support the channel, that would be really kind of you.
folks if you like these stories like we can't do them for free it'd be really kind if you could support the patreon there's a, a link below or you can support us on locals there's a, a a link below we only ask for 199 um a month friends it's not it it you know, it, it's not a fortune, but it just helps us to bring you these stories that you're never going to hear again. And if we didn't tell them, they would they would disappear. They would disappear from the history book. So once again, massive thank you, Paul. Big love to everybody at home. That's great. We're going to see you all again soon. Thank you. Cheers, Chris.